Principle 47. Inquire Within. Brain researchers estimate that your unconscious database outweighs the conscious on an order exceeding 10 million to 1. This database is the source of your hidden natural genius. In other words, a part of you is much smarter than you are. The wise people regularly consult that smarter part. Michael J. Gelb, author of How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci and Discover Your Genius. According to an ancient legend, there was a time when ordinary people had access to all the knowledge of the gods. Yet time and again they ignored this wisdom. One day the gods grew tired of so freely giving a gift the people didn't use, so they decided to hide this precious wisdom where only the most committed of seekers would discover it. They believed that if people had to work to find this wisdom, they would use it more carefully. One of the gods suggested that they bury it deep in the earth. No, the others said. Too many people could easily dig down and find it. Let's put it in the deepest ocean, suggested one of the gods. But that idea was also rejected. They knew that people would one day learn to dive and thus would find it too easily. One of the gods suggested hiding it in the highest mountaintop, but it was quickly agreed that people could climb mountains. Finally, one of the wisest gods suggested, Let's hide it deep inside the people themselves. They'll never think to look in there. And so it came to be, and so it continues today. Trust Your Intuition for most of us, our early education and training focused on looking outside of ourselves for the answers to our questions. Few of us have had any training on how to look inside, and yet most of the super successful people I have met over the years are people who have developed their intuition and learned to trust their gut feelings and follow their inner guidance. Many practice some sort of daily meditation to access this voice within. Bert Dubin at the time a successful real estate investor, now creator of the Burt Dubin Speaking Success System, serving speakers worldwide, knows all about trusting his intuition. For some time he had been looking to buy a four-corner property in Kingman, Arizona. He knew it would be a good investment. But he had not been able to locate a property that was for sale. One night he went to bed, as usual, only to be awakened at 3 a.m., with a clear inner message that he was to drive to Kingman, Arizona, now. Bird found this strange because he had called a realtor in Kingman earlier that same day and was told there was no four-corner properties listed for sale. But having learned to trust his inner messages, Bird immediately got in his car and drove through the night, arriving at Kingman at 8 a.m. He went to Howard Johnson's, bought a paper, and turned to the real estate section where he saw a four-corner property for sale. He went directly to the real estate office at 9 a.m. and had the property in escrow by 9.15. But how was this possible? He had called the day before to find no four-corner properties for sale. But at 4.30 the previous day, a property owner had called from New York to sell his property. He needed the money. Because it was too late to get the property into the multiple listings, but knowing that the weekly paper didn't close until 5 p.m., the agent had called the paper and purchased an ad. Because Bert had trusted his still small voice within, he managed to purchase this prime piece of real estate before anyone else even knew it was available. When business magnate Conrad Hilton, founder of the Hilton Hotels Corporation, wanted to buy the Stevens Corporation at auction, he submitted a sealed bid for $165,000. When he awakened the next morning with the number 180,000 in his head, he swiftly changed his bid to $180,000, successfully securing the company and earning a $2 million profit. The next highest bid was $179,800. Whether they are a real estate investor who hears a voice in the middle of the night, a detective who solves a dead-end case by following a hunch, an investor who just knows when to get out of the market, or a football linebacker who can sense what the quarterback's next play is going to be. Successful people trust their intuition. 
You too can use your intuition to make more money, make better decisions, solve problems quicker, unleash your creative genius, discern people's hidden motives, envision a new business, and create winning business plans and strategies. Everyone has intuition. It's just a matter of developing it. All the resources we need are in the mind. Theodore Roosevelt, 26th President of the United States Intuition is not something relegated to certain people or to physics. Everyone has it, and everyone has experienced it. Have you ever been thinking about your old friend Jerry, and then the phone rings and it's Jerry on the line who was just thinking about you? Have you ever awakened in the middle of the night and knew something had happened to one of your children, only to find out later that it was the exact moment your son was in an automobile accident? Have you ever felt a burning sensation on the back of your neck, and then turned to see a man staring at you from across the room? We've all experienced this kind of intuition. The trick is to learn how to tap into it at will to achieve greater levels of success. Using Meditation to Access Your Intuition When I was 35, I attended a meditation retreat that permanently changed my life. For an entire week, we sat in meditation from 6.30 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, with breaks only for meals and silent walks. Over the first few days, I thought I would go crazy. I would either fall asleep from years of not getting enough sleep, or my mind would race with one topic to another as I reviewed every experience from my past, planned how to improve my business, and wondered what I was doing sitting in a meditation hall while everyone else I knew was out enjoying life. On the fourth day, an unexpected and wonderful thing happened. My mind became quiet and I moved into a place from which I could just witness everything that was occurring around me without judgment or attachment. I was aware of sounds, sensations in my body, and a profound sense of inner peace. Thoughts still came and went, but not at the same pace or of the same kind. The thoughts were deeper, what we might call insights, deeper understandings, and wisdom. I saw connections I had never seen before. I understood my motivations, fears, and desires at a deeper level. Creative solutions to problems that I had been facing in my life came into my consciousness. I felt relaxed, calm, aware, and clearer than I had ever felt before. Gone were the pressures to perform, to prove myself, to explain myself, to measure up to some external standard, to meet the needs of others. Instead, there was a deep sense of myself and my purpose in life. When I focused on my deepest, most heartfelt goals and desires, solutions would come pouring into my mind, clear thoughts and images of the steps I would need to take, the people I would need to talk to, and the ways to transcend any obstacles I might encounter. It was truly magical. What I learned from this experience was that all the ideas I needed to complete any task, solve any problem, or achieve any goal were all available inside me. I have used this valuable insight ever since. Regular Meditation Will Deepen Your Intuition The regular practice of meditation will help you clear out distractions and teach you to recognize subtle impulses from within. Think of parents sitting on a bench on the edge of a playground filled with children laughing and yelling at each other. In the midst of all this noise, the parents can pick out their own child's voice from all the other voices on the playground. Your intuition works the same way. As you meditate and become more spiritually attuned, you can better discern and recognize the sound of your higher self or the voice of God speaking to you through words, images, and sensations. The intellect has little to do on the road to discovery. There comes a leap in consciousness, call it intuition or what you will, and the solution comes to you, and you don't know how or why. Albert Einstein, Physicist and Nobel Laureate The Answers Lie Within when Mark Victor Hansen and I were nearing completion of our first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, we still did not have a title for it. Because Mark and I both meditate, we decided to inquire within. 
Every day for a week, we asked our internal guidance for a best-selling title. Mark went to bed every night repeating the phrase, Mega Best-Selling Title, and would awaken every morning and immediately go into meditation. I simply asked God to give me the best title for the book, and then I would sit with my eyes closed in a state of relaxed expectancy, waiting patiently for an answer to come. On the third morning, I suddenly saw a hand write the words chicken soup on a blackboard in my mind. My immediate reaction was, what does chicken soup have to do with our book? I heard a voice in my head respond, chicken soup is what your grandmother gave you when you were sick as a child. But this book isn't about sick people, I thought. People's spirits are sick, my inner voice replied. Millions of people are depressed and living in fear and resignation that things will never get better. This book will inspire them and uplift their spirits. During the remaining minutes of that meditation, the title evolved from Chicken Soup for the Spirit to Chicken Soup for the Soul to Chicken Soup for the Soul, 101 Stories to Open the Heart and Rekindle the Spirit. When I first heard Chicken Soup for the Soul, I got goosebumps. I have since learned that giving me goosebumps is one of the ways my intuition tells me I am on track. Ten minutes later, I told my wife, and she got goosebumps, too. Then I called Mark, and he got goosebumps. We were on to something right, and we all knew it. Over the last twenty years... Chicken Soup for the Soul has become a brand responsible for more than $2 billion in sales of books and many licensed products, including pet food and greeting cards. How Your Intuition Communicates With You Your intuition can communicate with you in many ways. You may get a message from within as a vision or a visual image while you are meditating or dreaming. I often get images while I'm laying in bed after I first wake up while I'm meditating or getting a massage, or while sitting in a hot tub or taking a shower. It can come in a flash out of the blue, or it can be a long, unfolding image like a movie. Your intuition may speak to you as a hunch, a thought, or a voice actually telling you, yes, no, go for it, or not yet. It might come as one resounding word, a short sentence, or a complete lecture. You may find you can dialogue with the voice for clarification or more information. You may also receive a message from your intuition through your physical senses. If the message is one of watch out or be careful, you may experience it as a chill, the creeps, a sense of restlessness, discomfort in your gut, constriction in your chest, tightness or pain in your head, even a sour taste in your mouth. A positive or yes message might come in the form of goosebumps, a dizzy feeling, warmth, a sense of opening or expansiveness in the chest, a sense of relaxation, a feeling of relief, or a letting go of tension. You may also experience intuitive messages through your emotions, such as a feeling of uneasiness, concern, or confusion. Or when information is of a positive nature, you may experience a feeling of joy, euphoria, or profound inner peace. Sometimes it is just a sense of knowing. How many times have you heard someone say, I don't know how I knew, I just knew, or I knew it in my heart, or in the depth of my soul? An indicator that the message is truly from your intuition is that it will often be accompanied by a sense of greater clarity, a feeling of rightness about the answer or the impulse. Another indicator that the message you are receiving is a correct one is an accompanying feeling of passion and excitement. If you are considering a plan of action or a decision, and it leaves you feeling constricted, drained, bored, or enervated, that's a clear message saying, don't go there. On the other hand, if you feel expansive, energized, or enthusiastic, your intuition is telling you to go ahead. Intuitive answers can come any time. Your most valuable intuitive wisdom may also come through the many forms of informal meditation we engage in every day, such as sitting by a waterfall, watching the ocean, staring at the clouds or the stars, 
sitting under a tree, staring into a fire, listening to inspiring music, jogging, doing yoga, while praying, listening to a bird sing, taking a shower, driving on the freeway, watching a child play, or writing in a personal journal. Intuition isn't mystical. Dr. James Watson, Nobel Laureate and Co-Discoverer of DNA. You can even do informal meditation in an abbreviated way during the middle of a hectic day. When you need help making a decision, take time to pause, take a deep breath, reflect on the question, and allow the intuitive impressions to come to you. Pay attention to any images, words, physical sensations, or emotions you experience. Sometimes you will find that intuitive insights will immediately come into your awareness. Other times they may come later in the day when you least expect it. The Quick Coherence Technique One of the simplest yet most powerful techniques I've learned, and now teach in all my workshops, is the Quick Coherence Technique, developed by the Institute of Heart Math in Boulder Creek, California. It's the fastest technique I've found to bring yourself into that relaxed and centered state from which you can access the higher dimensions of your consciousness, and therefore make better decisions and determine more effective solutions to whatever problems you might be facing. Coherence is a term researchers use to describe a psychophysiological state in which your nervous, cardiovascular, hormonal, and immune systems are all working together efficiently and harmoniously. Doc Childre and Deborah Rosman of the Institute of Heart Math explain it this way. Research has found that the pattern of your heart rhythm reflects the state of your emotions and nervous system dynamics. For example, when you are feeling tense, irritable, impatient, frustrated, or anxious, your heart rhythm shifts into a disordered and incoherent pattern. No wonder you can't calm your mind in this state. Your heart signals incoherence to the brain, which inhibits your higher brain functions and triggers a stress response. You can't perceive as clearly, and old emotional issues can start coming to the surface. You can use the quick coherence technique to bring your heart rhythms into coherence and enable your brain to synchronize with your heart's coherent rhythm. Start by learning how to shift into a heart-focused, positive emotional state through three simple steps. The steps. 1. Heart focus. Focus your attention in the area of your heart, in the center of your chest. If you prefer, the first couple of times you try it, you can place your hand over the center of your chest to help keep your attention in the heart area. 2. Heart breathing. As you focus on the area of your heart, breathe deeply but normally and imagine your breath is coming in and going out through your heart area. Continue breathing with ease until you find a natural inner rhythm that feels good to you. 3. Heart Feeling As you continue to breathe through the area of your heart, recall a positive feeling, a time when you felt good inside, and try to re-experience the feeling. It could be feeling appreciation for the good things in your life, or the love and care you feel for a family member, close friend, or a pet. This is the most important step. The next step is to take this technique and make it a habit. We recommend you do this by picking certain times of the day when you can give yourself a guilt-free three to five minutes to focus on your heart, the start of your day, right before lunch, and just before bed. When you find yourself waiting in line instead of getting aggravated, you can use the time to practice the technique. You'll be amazed at how different your experience of waiting can be, and instead of draining your energy by focusing on the negative, you'll be using the time to recenter and charge. The more you practice, the more quickly heart coherence will emerge and be easier to sustain. Once you start using this powerful centering tool, you may want to see for yourself how it affects your physiology. To help you do that, HeartMath has developed the M-Wave, Emotion Wave technology, that actually tracks your coherence level using lights, sounds, and visuals, training to help you increase coherence for longer periods. There is both a simple-to-use handheld device and a smartphone app available. 
Using this technology can quickly lead you to periods of higher coherence, a state that many people who meditate spend years trying to achieve. Ask questions. Your intuition can also provide you with the answers to anything you need to know. Ask questions that begin with, Should I? and What should I do about? and How can I? and What can I do to? You can ask your intuition questions such as, Should I take this job? What should I do about the lack of morale in the company? What can I do to increase sales? Should I marry this person? What can I do to lower my time in the marathon? How can I achieve my ideal weight? What should I do next? The Sway Test An easy way to get a clear yes or no answer from your intuition is to simply ask your body. I discussed somatic decision-making, the Sway Test, in Principle 6, Use the Law of Attraction. But it's also a powerful technique for accessing your intuition. In the field of energy psychology, the Sway Test is based on the theory that your body and mind have vast intelligence, not only your entire lifetime's worth of knowledge, responses, emotions, and goals, whether you remember them or not, but also innate knowledge about what is best for you. Just as a plant will grow toward the sun, the human body will incline toward what is best for it. When you ask your body questions about what's right for you, it will lean backward or forward in response to your queries. I started using the Sway Test to ask questions about specific foods, supplements, sleep, and exercise. Then I used it for questions related to my relationships. Now I use it as part of all my decision-making. I've put complete instructions for the Sway Test online at our company website, www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Scroll down to Principle 47 and click on the link. Write down your answers. Whenever you access your intuition, make sure to immediately write down any impressions you receive. Intuitive impressions are often subtle and therefore evaporate very quickly, so make sure to capture them in writing as soon as possible. Recent research in neuroscience indicates that an intuitive insight or any new idea not captured within 37 seconds is likely never to be recalled again. In seven minutes, it's gone forever. As my buddy Mark Victor Hansen likes to say, as soon as you think it, ink it. Make sure you always have your smartphone or a memo pad with you so you can record any intuitive insights or ideas that emerge. Take immediate action. Pay attention to the answers you receive and act on the information as quickly as possible. When you act on the information you receive, you'll find that you get more and more intuitive impulses. After a while, you will be living in the flow. It will all seem easy and effortless as the wisdom comes to you and you simply act on it. As you learn to trust yourself and your intuition more, it will become automatic. Experts agree that your intuition works better when you trust it. The more you demonstrate faith in your intuition, the more you will see the results of it in your life. I strongly encourage you to listen to your intuition, trust it, and follow it. Trusting your intuition is simply another form of trusting yourself, and the more you trust yourself, the more success you will have. Remember, it's not what you think of. It's what you write down and take action on that counts. She listened and took action. Madeline Belletta is a very spiritual person. For her, inquiring within means talking to God and listening to His answers. Madeline's life and her own success path were dramatically changed when she and her fellow church members prayed for a solution to her fatigue and heard the words, Fresh Royal Jelly. Not understanding this clear directive, she investigated and discovered that royal jelly was the food substance worker bees fed to the queen in their hives, a wholesome and highly nourishing liquid that was just starting to be distributed in England as a nutritional supplement. After taking royal jelly for a time, Madeline started to get better, 
and soon she began to pray about whether Royal Jelly was meant to do more than just help her. Start a company, was the response to her prayers, and so Madeline did. Today, Be Alive is a multi-million dollar company that has distributed nutritional products containing royal jelly to hundreds of thousands of people nationwide. And through it all, Madeline has prayerfully asked for guidance and listened attentively to the answers. I believe God gave me the vision, the inspiration, the strength, and the courage to see it all through, said Madeline. For example, by her second year in business, Madeline's marketing efforts had produced few results. In fact, with only $450 left in her checking account, her accountant advised that she fold up shop and move on. Madeline returned from that meeting, locked herself in her room, and cried and prayed and cried and prayed. On the third day, Madeline received the word radio and decided to bet the farm, her remaining $450, on ten radio commercials that cost $45 apiece. Within days, she was making steady sales again. Impressed by her passionate commitment to her product, the radio station eventually interviewed her on one of their talk shows. And by the time she returned home from that interview, recording artist Pat Boone had called asking about Royal Jelly and how it might help his daughter, Debbie. A few months later, Boone called back to tell her how pleased he was with the effects of the Royal Jelly. When he said, If there's anything I can ever do for you, I'd be glad to. Madeline asked him to record three radio commercials. Boone agreed. And soon, Be Alive was on 400 radio stations across America, selling millions of dollars' worth of product. What might happen when you inquire within? For Madeline Belletta, praying, listening quietly, and acting on what she heard meant the development of a successful company serving hundreds of thousands of satisfied customers, as well as the creation of an unimaginable lifestyle for her and her family. Be Mindful In addition to inquiring within and regularly accessing your intuition, successful people also maintain a state of mindfulness. They know that mindset matters a lot. Dawa Tarchin Phillips, a mindfulness research specialist at the University of California, Santa Barbara, defines mindfulness as bringing one's complete attention to the present experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. It means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. When you use the principles in this book to focus on your future, it's also imperative that you stay rooted in the present, that you take action and maintain a growth-oriented mindset. Cultivating the skill of mindfulness will help you stay focused on doing those things that will get you to where you want to be. For Dawa's complete tutorial on becoming more mindful, present, and self-supporting as you implement the success principles, visit www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Scroll down to Principle 47 and click on the appropriate link. Part 4. Create Successful Relationships Personal relationships are the fertile soil from which all advancement, all success, all achievement in real life grows. Ben Stein, writer, actor, and game show host. Principle 48. Be here now. Listen a hundred times. Ponder a thousand times. Speak once. Source unknown. There's a big difference between hearing, that is simply receiving communication, and truly listening, which is the art of paying thoughtful attention with a mind toward understanding the complete message being delivered. Unlike simply hearing someone's words, Listening requires maintaining eye contact, watching the person's body language, asking for clarification, and listening for the unspoken message. In the news reporting industry, journalists are trained in the art of active listening, an interview technique in which reporters listen and understand so well. They're able to ask intelligent, more in-depth questions about the information being delivered. 
Active listening is how good news stories are developed, and how many of us can improve our relationships, too. Not surprisingly, it also helps ensure accuracy and fairness, two of the most important hallmarks of a journalist, and two important qualities of any relationship. Listening pays off. Marcia Martin is an executive coach. One of her clients, a senior vice president at a major bank, asked her if she could help him make his team meetings more powerful. He complained that his direct team wasn't really operating the way he wanted it to in their meetings. They didn't bring the right things to the meeting, they weren't focused on the right things, and they didn't present properly. When Marcia asked him what he did in his meetings and what the problems were, he said he always started off his meetings by telling them what the purpose of the meeting was, what he felt their breakdowns were, and what he wanted them to do. By the time he finished describing his meetings, she could tell the whole meeting was him just spitting out instructions to his team members. Marcia told him, I would advise you to start your meeting with just one sentence. The purpose of this meeting is for me to find out from you what you feel is going on in each of your departments, what you feel the breakdowns are, and what you need from me. And then you should be quiet and just let them talk and talk and talk until they have totally talked themselves out. If they stop talking, just say, well, what else? And let them talk some more. She explained that his people probably hadn't had a chance to really empty out their feelings, their viewpoints, their suggestions, or their questions. He was packing them with too much information and all of his opinions, and he wasn't really listening. She told him to allow two hours for the meeting and not to say anything during that whole time. He was just to listen, write down notes, and nod his head, be present and be interested, but not speak. Three days later, he pulled Marcia aside to tell her that he'd just had the most fantastic, powerful meeting he'd ever experienced in his life. He had done exactly what she'd suggested, and had listened in a way that he had never listened before. As a result, his team members had talked and talked and talked, and he had learned more about what his people were going through, what his people needed, and what to do for them in that one meeting than he had in all of his previous executive experience. Argue Less and Listen More A New York photographer I once met traveled all over the world doing expensive location shoots for big-name clients like Revlon and Lancome. At one point he shared with me how he would give clients exactly what they had asked for then be mystified when they didn't like the end result. Even if it were the pyramids in Egypt, he said, they would ask him to shoot it over. It did no good to become defensive or argue with the clients, even though he had followed their specifications perfectly. Instead, he eventually learned, after losing several lucrative accounts, that all he had to do was say, So let me see if I've got this right. You want more of this and less of that, correct? Okay. I'll go reshoot it and bring it back so you can see if you like it. In other words, he learned to argue less with the people who were paying the bills and to listen more, responding and adjusting to their feedback until they were satisfied. Be interested rather than interesting. Another way people fail to listen carefully is to be too concerned with being interesting themselves rather than being interested in the person they're listening to. They believe the route to success is to constantly talk, showing off their expertise or intelligence with their words and comments. The best way to establish rapport with people and to win them over to your side is to be truly interested in them, to listen with the intention of really learning about them. When the person feels that you are really interested in getting to know them and their feelings, they will open up to you and share their true feelings with you much more quickly. Work to develop an attitude of curiosity. Be curious about other people, what they feel, how they think, how they see the world. What are their hopes, dreams, and fears? What are their aspirations? What obstacles are they facing in their lives? If you want people to cooperate with you, to like you, or to open up to you, you must be interested in them. Instead of focusing on yourself, start focusing on others. Notice what makes them happy or unhappy. When your thoughts are more on others than on yourself, 
you feel less stress. You can act and respond with more intelligence. Your production level increases, and you have more fun. Additionally, when you are interested, people respond to your interest in them. They want to be around you. Your popularity increases. A Powerful Question During my year of attending Dan Sullivan's Strategic Coach Program, he taught me one of the most powerful communication tools I have ever learned. It is one of the most effective ways to establish rapport and create a feeling of connection with another person. I have used it in both my business and personal life. It is a series of four questions. 1. If we were meeting three years from today, what has to have happened during that three-year period for you to feel happy about your progress? 2. What are your biggest dangers you'll have to face and deal with in order to achieve that progress? 3. What are the biggest opportunities that you have that you would need to focus on and capture to achieve those things? 4. What strengths will you need to reinforce and maximize, and what skills and resources will you need to develop that you don't currently have in order to capture those opportunities? About one week after I learned these questions, I was meeting with my sister Kim, who is the co-author of all of our early Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul books. I didn't feel like we were making much progress in getting connected, so I decided to try these new questions I had just learned, and then really listen. When I asked her the first question, it was as if I had magically opened a locked door. She proceeded to tell me about all of her hopes and dreams for her future. I think she must have talked for at least thirty minutes without interruption. Then I asked the second question. Off she went for another fifteen minutes. I didn't say one word. Then I asked the third and fourth questions. Over an hour later, she stopped. She was grinning from ear to ear and looked unusually calm and relaxed. She smiled at me and said, That's the best conversation I think we've ever had. I feel so clear and focused. I know exactly what I need to go and do now. Thank you. It was amazing. I hadn't said a word, except for asking the four questions. She had taken herself through a process of clarification with those questions. She hadn't clearly addressed them before and doing it with me had brought her great clarity and relief. I felt very connected to my sister, and she felt very connected to me. Up until then, I think I would have had a tendency at some point to jump in and tell her what I thought she should do, interrupting her own process of self-discovery by not listening. Since that time, I have used those questions with my wife, my children, my staff, my corporate clients, my coaching clients, prospective seminar participants, and numerous potential business partners. The results are always magical. It's your turn. Take the time today to write those four questions on an index card or in your smartphone or tablet and carry it with you. Practice each day asking someone these questions over lunch or dinner. Start with your friends and your family members, too. You'll be surprised how much you will learn and how much closer you will feel afterward. Use these questions with every potential business client or business colleague. Once they have answered, you'll know whether or not there is a basis for a business relationship. You'll know whether or not your products and services can help them achieve their goals. If you find they don't want to answer these questions, then they are not people you want to do business with. They are either unaware of their future and can't think ahead, which will make it hard for you to help them, or they are unwilling to tell you the answers which means there is no trust present and no basis for a relationship. One final suggestion. Make sure to take yourself through the same four questions either alone or on a piece of paper or verbally with a friend or mastermind partner. It's a valuable exercise. Principle 49. Have a heart talk. Most communication resembles a ping-pong game in which people are merely preparing to slam their next point across. But pausing to understand different points of view and associated feelings can turn apparent opponents into true members of the same team. Cliff Durfee, creator of the Heart Talk Process 
Unfortunately, in too many business, educational, and other settings, there is never an opportunity for feelings to be expressed and heard. So they build up to the point that people have no capacity to focus on the business at hand. There is too much emotional static in the space. It's like trying to put more water into a glass that is already full. There is nowhere for it to go. You must first pour out the old water to make room for the new. It's the same with emotions. People can't listen until they have been heard. They first need to get whatever is bothering them off their chest. Whether you are someone who has just come home from work, a parent looking at your child's report card with all C's, a salesperson attempting to sell a new car, or a CEO overseeing the merger of two companies, you first need to let the other people speak about their needs and wants, hopes and dreams, fears and concerns, hurts and pains, before you talk about yours. It opens up a space inside of them so they are able to listen and take in what you have to say. What is a heart talk? A heart talk is a structured communication process in which eight agreements are strictly adhered. It creates a safe environment for a deep level of communication to occur, without the fear of condemnation, unsolicited advice, interruption, or being rushed. It's also a powerful tool used to surface and release any unexpressed emotions that could otherwise get in the way of people being totally present to deal with the business at hand. It can be used at home, in business, in the classroom, with sports teams, and in religious settings to develop rapport, understanding, and intimacy. When to use a heart talk Heart talks are useful before or during a staff meeting. At the beginning of a business meeting where two new groups of people are coming together for the first time. After an emotionally stimulating event like a merger, a massive layoff, a death, a major athletic loss, an unexpected financial setback, or even a tragedy such as the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. When there is a conflict between two individuals, groups, or departments, on a regular basis at home, in the office, or in the classroom to create a deeper level of communication and intimacy. How to Conduct a Heart Talk a hard talk can be conducted with any size group of between 2 and 10 people. You'll want to break a group larger than 10 into several smaller groups, because if the group is larger than that, the trust and safety factors tend to diminish, and it can also take up too much time to complete. The first time you conduct a hard talk, start by explaining that there is value in occasionally using a structure for communication that guarantees a deeper level of listening. The structure of a heart talk creates a safe, non-judgmental space that supports the constructive, rather than the destructive, expression of feelings that, if left unexpressed, can block teamwork, synergy, creativity, innovation, and intuition, which are vital to the productivity and success of any venture. Guidelines for a heart talk Start by asking people to sit in a circle or around a table. Introduce the basic agreements, which include these. Only the person holding the heart is allowed to talk. You don't judge or criticize what anyone else has said. You pass the heart, or object, to the left after your turn, or say, I pass, if you have nothing to say. You talk only about how you feel. You keep the information that is shared confidential. You don't leave the heart talk until it's declared complete. Keep passing the heart or object around the circle, multiple times if necessary, to ensure participants have more than one opportunity to share. If you have plenty of time, a heart talk completes naturally when the heart makes a complete circle without anyone having something to say. Ask the group to agree to the guidelines which are very important to make sure that the talk does not deteriorate and lose its value. Because no one is supposed to talk except for the person holding the object, it is often best to wait until the completion of the talk to remind people about certain agreements that need more attention. Another option is to have the agreements written down on paper or a whiteboard and to merely point to them if someone is getting too far off track. Go around the group at least once 
with everybody getting one turn. Or set a time frame, say 15 minutes to 30 minutes, longer for more emotionally intense issues. And keep going around the group until the time runs out or nobody has anything more to say. You can use any object to pass around. A ball, a paperweight, a book. Anything that can be seen by the other participants. I have seen everything from a stuffed animal, a hospital staff, a baseball, a college baseball team, and a football helmet, a state championship football team, to a Native American talking stick on a corporate river rafting trip. I actually prefer to use the stuffed red velvet hearts that Cliff Durfee, the originator of the heart talk method, sells on his website, because they remind everyone what they are hearing is coming from the other person's heart and that we are trying to get to the heart of the matter at hand. Results you can expect from a heart talk. You can expect the following results from a heart talk. Enhanced listening skills, constructive expression of feelings, improved conflict resolution skills, improved abilities to let go of resentments and old issues, development of mutual respect and understanding, greater sense of connection, unity, and bonding. One of the most valuable uses of the heart talk for me was in the week-long training that I was conducting for 120 school administrators in Bergen, Norway. We were about to start our afternoon session when someone announced that one of the workshop participants had been killed in an automobile accident during the lunch break. There was massive shock and grief in the room. It would have been impossible to proceed with the scheduled agenda. So I divided the participants into groups of six and taught them the guidelines for a heart talk. I told them to just keep passing the heart around until everyone in the group said, I pass, twice in a row, meaning that there was nothing else to be said. The groups talked and cried for over an hour. People talked about their grief, their own sense of mortality, how precious and fleeting life really is, how scary life can sometimes be and how you need to live in the moment because your future is never guaranteed. We then took a short break and were able to proceed with the scheduled activities. Whatever emotions there were had been expressed and heard. The group was once again ready to focus on the subject I was there to teach. A Heart Talk Saves the Family Business James owned a small family business that had supported him and his family for years. His wife and two sons, both married with children, also worked as employees in the company. At least once a week, they would all gather together for a large meal, and James would do his best to unify his growing family. James hoped that when he retired, the family business would survive and continue to provide a living for everyone in the extended family. Though it looked like an excellent plan on the surface, there had always been rivalry and competition between the two sons— and when both their wives started working in the business, things started coming apart at the seams. Resentments over little things were pushed down to supposedly keep the peace, but they would resurface later in sarcastic comments and unexpected outbursts of anger. When the two sons actually threw a couple of punches at each other, James realized they all needed to talk and clear the air. But he was afraid that the situation could become even more explosive unless there were some powerful ground rules present. So he decided to use the structure of a heart talk. Sitting in a large circle after their weekly family meal, the group was unusually quiet, not knowing what to expect. James started by getting everyone to agree to the eight rules and the structure of the talk. At first, the heart was passed without much to say. The second time around, one of the sons expressed his anger, and when the heart reached the other son, even greater hostility surfaced. Yet it was clear no one was going to violate the guidelines, stomp out of the room, or throw something. It wasn't an easy talk, and there were times you could tell everyone would have preferred any other activity, even if it were doing the dishes. But as the heart kept going around the circle, everyone began to have the experience that he or she had been heard, and the hostility began to dissipate. Then one of the son's wives started crying, and shared that she was at her wit's end. With all the friction in the family and in the business, she couldn't take it anymore. She said that something had to change. At that moment, something released. 
and there wasn't a dry eye in the group. As the heart continued around and around, the sadness was soon replaced by an acknowledgment of their love for each other and the things they were grateful for. Though it will never be known for sure, James believes that that heart talk was most likely the key thing that saved his business, his family, and his sanity. Principle 50. Tell the truth faster. When in doubt, tell the truth. Mark Twain. Author of several classic American works of fiction, including Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Most of us avoid telling the truth because it's uncomfortable. We're afraid of the consequences, making others feel uncomfortable, hurting their feelings, or risking their anger. And yet, when we don't tell the truth, and others don't tell us the truth, we can't deal with matters from a basis in reality. We've all heard the phrase that the truth will set you free, and it will. The truth allows us to be free to deal with the way things are, not the way we imagine them to be, or hope them to be, or might manipulate them to be with our lies. Telling the truth also frees up our energy. It takes energy to withhold the truth, keep a secret, or keep up an act. What happens when you tell the truth? In my four-day advanced seminar, I often do a process called secrets. It's a very simple exercise where we spend an hour or two telling the group our secrets, those things we imagine that if others knew, they surely wouldn't like us or approve of us. I invite participants to simply stand up and tell the group whatever it is they've been hiding and then sit down. There is no discussion and no feedback, just sharing and listening. It starts out slowly as people test the water with, I cheated on my eighth grade math exam, and I stole a penknife from the hardware store when I was fourteen years old. But as people begin to realize that nothing bad is happening to anyone, people eventually open up and talk about deeper, more painful issues. After there are no more secrets to come out, I ask the group if they feel any less loving or accepting toward anyone in the group. In all these years, I have never had anyone answer yes. Then I ask, how many people feel relieved to have gotten this off their chest? Everyone says that they do. And then I ask, how many of you feel closer to the other people in the group? And again, all the hands go up. People realize that the things they've been hiding aren't so horrible, but in fact are usually shared by at least a few others in the group. They are not alone, but rather a part of the human community. But most astounding is what people report over the next few days. Lifelong migraines disappear. Spastic colons relax and medication is no longer needed. Depression lifts and aliveness returns. People actually look years younger and more vital. It's quite amazing. One participant actually reported losing five pounds of excess weight over the ensuing two days. He had indeed released more than just some withheld information. This example tells us that it takes a lot of energy to hold back our truth, and that energy, when it is released, can be used to focus on creating greater success in all areas of our lives. We can become less cautious and more spontaneous, more willing to be our natural selves. And when this happens, information that is vital to making things work and to getting things done can be shared and acted on. What do you need to share? In every area of our lives, the three things that most need to be shared are resentments that have built up, the unmet needs and demands that underlie those resentments, and unexpressed appreciations. Underneath all resentments are unfilled needs and desires. Whenever you find yourself resenting someone, ask yourself, what is it that I'm wanting from him that I'm not getting? And then make the commitment to at least ask for it. As we have talked about earlier, the worst thing that you'll get is a no. You might get a yes, but at least the request will be out in the open. One of the most valuable practices, and yet the hardest to do for most people, is telling the truth when it is uncomfortable. Most of us are so worried about hurting other people's feelings that we don't share our true feelings. We end up hurting ourselves instead. Telling the truth pays dividends. Shortly after I created the Foundation for Self-Esteem, 
to take my work to the non-profit world of education, prisons, social services, and other at-risk populations. My director, Larry Price, discovered a request for a proposal that had been issued by the Los Angeles County Office of Education. It turns out that more than 84% of the people going through the county's welfare-to-work orientation program never returned after the first day to start the job training portion. The county knew it needed an orientation program that would give people hope and motivate them to complete their job training and create a better life for themselves and their families. We knew we could design a program that met the county's specifications in their request for proposals, but we also knew it would not include enough contact hours and reinforcement to produce the results that the county was hoping for. It was clear that the way the county had envisioned the program just wouldn't work. Eager to land the $730,000 contract and provide the foundation with badly needed operating funds, However, we decided to create an extensive proposal and worked for months crafting a beautiful presentation. The night before it was due, we even stayed up all night finalizing, printing, and collating the numerous copies that were to be submitted. It must have been a good proposal, because we were selected as one of the three finalists and were called into the county offices for a live interview and final presentation. I can still remember standing in front of the county offices saying to Larry, You know, I'm not sure I want to win this competition. No matter how good a program we put together, the way they want it structured can't possibly give them the results they want. I think we should tell them the truth. How are they to know how it needs to be structured? They're not the motivation experts. How could they ask for something they didn't fully understand? Our fear was that the county officers would feel somehow judged or criticized and award the contract to someone else. It was a huge risk especially with the dollar figure involved. But we decided to tell the truth. The reaction of the county officers surprised us. After listening to our point of view, they decided to hire us anyway, because we were willing to tell the truth. After analyzing what we said, they agreed and felt we were the only ones who correctly understood the situation they were dealing with. The results were so fantastic that eventually the program we developed— the Goals Program, was adopted by 19 other county welfare programs, plus organizations in 22 other states like the Housing and Urban Development Authority, Head Start, and as a pre-release program for San Quentin and several other prisons. For information on the Goals Program, visit www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. So far... 810,000 people have graduated from the program. There's no perfect time to tell the hard truth. As I discovered with the Los Angeles County Office of Education, telling the truth was the difference between winning the contract and losing it. We could have compromised our integrity, but we decided instead to tell the truth sooner rather than later. Learning to speak your truth sooner is one of the most important success habits you will ever develop. In fact, as soon as you start asking yourself the question, I wonder when would be the best time to tell the truth, that's actually the best time to do so. Will it be uncomfortable? Probably. Will it create lots of reactions? Yes. But it is the right thing to do. Get into the habit of telling the truth faster. Ultimately, you want to get to the point where you say it as soon as you think of it. That's when you become totally authentic. What you see is what you get. People will know where you stand. You can be counted on to speak your mind. I don't want to hurt their feelings. A lot of times people use the excuse that they don't want to hurt other person's feelings. This is always a lie. If you ever catch yourself thinking this, what's really happening is that you're protecting yourself from your own feelings. You're avoiding what you feel when they get upset. It is the coward's way out, and it simply delays having all your cards on the table. This includes telling the kids that you are getting a divorce, that the family is moving to Texas because Daddy got a new job, that you are going to have to lay off some staff members, that you aren't going to be taking a family vacation this year, that you have to put the family pet to sleep, that you aren't going to be able to deliver the order by the date you promised, or that you lost the family nest egg in a bad stock deal. 
Hiding the truth always backfires. The longer you withhold it, the more disservice you do to yourself and to the others involved. You won't want to hear this, but... I don't want any yes-men around me. I want everybody to tell me the truth, even if it costs them their jobs. Samuel Goldwyn, co-founder of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer MGM Studios. Marilyn Tam was working as a divisional manager overseeing the operations of 320 stores for Miller's Outpost when a friend told her Nike was planning to open their own concept stores and CEO Phil Knight was interested in hiring her to oversee the project. Nike was frustrated because sport shoe stores like Foot Locker weren't displaying their clothing apparel in a way that properly portrayed Nike's lifestyle image. Because Marilyn thought that working for Nike would be a great opportunity, she did some research prior to her meeting by visiting a number of different stores that carried Nike apparel, so that she would be ready to make a proposal to Phil about how to create a store Nike would be proud to present to the world. As she did her research, she discovered two things. The footwear was good. It was functional, durable, and priced well. But the apparel was a disaster. It was inconsistent in quality, sizing, and durability, and it was not integrated or color-coordinated. She found out later that Nike's clothing line had been an afterthought in response to consumer demand for more Nike logo apparel. It had not been thought out in a coordinated way. Nike had simply gone out and bought stock goods and just put its own label on them. The company bought apparel from different manufacturers without any consistent standards in size, quality, or color. It was not an image that was really reflective of the brand. Marilyn's dilemma was that her desire to work for Nike was in conflict with her professional judgment about the products. She was afraid that if she told Phil that the product wasn't consistent with the brand image and shouldn't be in stores, she wouldn't get the job. When she finally met with Phil Knight in Oregon, the initial conversation about the potential of the new store concept was exciting. But as the conversation unfolded, Marilyn became more and more uncomfortable because she knew she needed to tell him the truth about the quality of the merchandise and her belief that the stores would fail if they went ahead without first creating a standardized and integrated product line. But she hesitated because she feared that, in his haste to get the stores up and running, he might just find someone else to do it. After two hours, she finally spoke up and told Phil that the Nike shoes were great, but if they were going to do a concept store based on apparel, she thought the stores would fail, because the products would not reflect what Nike stood for. Just as she feared, her disclosure ended the conversation rather quickly. She flew back to California wondering if she had done the right thing. She felt that she had probably lost any chance of getting a job there. But she also felt good about having told the truth. Two weeks later, Phil Knight called her and told her he had reconsidered what she said, had done his own research on the quality of the merchandise, and agreed with her assessment of the situation. He offered her the job as the first vice president of apparel and accessories. He told her, You come, fix the goods, then we open the stores. As you probably know, the rest is history. Though the decision to wait held up the opening of the Nike stores by about two years, the apparel division has had huge growth, and the concept stores have helped Nike continue to expand and take even greater hold on the American imagination. I highly recommend Marilyn's inspirational book, How to Use What You've Got to Get What You Want. In it, she shares her extraordinary life and the principles of success she has learned from her birth into a traditional family in Hong Kong, to her meteoric rise through the executive ranks of the international business world with such world-class companies as Avida, Reebok, and Nike. <laughs>